Today, August 24th marks nearly a decade without one of anime's most brilliant. Nine years on, Satoshi Kon's passing at the young age of 46 still leaves a massive hole never to be filled. Despite only directing four feature films and one TV anime, Khan is widely considered to be one of the most profound creative minds the industry has ever witnessed. Visually stunning and thematically rich head trips typified his work. But what always hit me the hardest was Khan's ability to see past the facade and pull out the earnesty of people for both better and worse. There's something so emotionally raw yet mature about his characters, leaving an instant layer of nostalgia over everything he touched at the director's home. I recently had the good fortune to catch Millennium Actress in theaters, which is wild to watch in retrospect of Khan's passing. A reflective journey of a star actress at the end of her life, chasing a forever lost love. The emotional catharsis of what it must be like to see the end coming and embrace it is informative of how Khan came to grapple with his own terminal cancer diagnosis. Millennium Actress came out nine years before he would be diagnosed, but Khan at the age of 37 already had an understanding and appreciation of mortality that takes most of us a lifetime to grasp. Longtime friend Masa Mariyama put it best, anime like Millennium's protagonist Gyoko has been chasing a ghost ever since Khan's passing. In his waning months, Satoshi Khan compiled his thoughts in a blog post. Though I'd highly recommend it, calling it a rough read doesn't even begin to encompass it all. The first time I did so, I was in tears. Hell, every now and again, I skim through still, and it's not any easier. Reading the degrading thoughts of a man whose body is being ravaged by disease. Angry to be leaving his wife, ashamed of the fact that he was putting his mother and father through a parent's worst nightmare. Having watched one of my closest friends go through the same struggle, Khan's work is like a holy scripture. Words which have helped me come to terms with mortality in these years where I've been reminded of our fragility so often. A shining beacon of the impact I hope I can capture some small semblance of someday. I used to honestly think that I can't help if I die any day. Still, it was so sudden. Khan always seemed to create with a fraction of that mentality. He came to every film as if it were to be his last. Tomorrow isn't guaranteed. If you have something to say, say it. If you live for a dream, chase it. Such honesty is why I find episode 10 of Paranoia Agent to be an admirable damnation of the very industry which Khan loved and grew famous from. If you are at all familiar with the anime and manga industry, then you know the terrible conditions many work under. You've heard how the Yu Yu Hakusho and Hunter x Hunter author Yoshihiro Togashi cancelled the former after stress-related health issues and has put the latter on hiatus on numerous occasions. Once doing the math on the amount of free time he has in a week while working on manga and sussing out it comes to about 4 hours. You may also know the average starting pay for animators in the industry as of 2018 was roughly the US dollar equivalent of $14,040 yearly. Yearly! for a high skill position that many go to college for. It's why organizations like the Animator Dormitory Project exist to supplement such awful pay even though they shouldn't have to. In 2017, veteran animator Kazunori Mizuno passed away at his desk at the age of 52 with concerns of overwork surrounding his death. Disappearance Diary is an autobiographical manga all about the author Hideo Azuma's struggle with mental health, homelessness, and alcohol abuse which came about in part of the stress of writing manga. It's also why after the tragedy at Kyoto Animation earlier this year that claimed 35 lives, many celebrated the studio for being exceptional when it comes to worker compensation, benefits, and studio culture. There are seemingly endless examples how those most responsible for anime are mistreated. To bring it back to Satoshi Khan, in 2004, he and the staff at Madhouse created Paranoia Agent, forcing the heads of a major studio and Japanese TV broadcasters to air its 10th episode, entitled Mellow Marumi, which heavily criticizes the working conditions in anime production. The episode begins with a very different art style to the usual Khan aesthetic. It falls more in line with the mascot character of Marumi, even breaking into lightly animated keyframe sketches, then rough storyboards as the camera pulls out to reveal a production studio where voice actors are recording. As is with many of Khan's work, the barriers of reality are thin. 
Marumi starts to directly address the audience, informing us of the roles at his studio, teaching us how anime production is a complicated, high-skill endeavor that operates on ridiculously tight deadlines, leaving even the tiniest of missteps to be potentially catastrophic. For example, an assistant production manager dozing off. It's here we get the first of many excellent cuts. Coming as the aforementioned production manager, Saruta snaps awake in his car, a second before being in a well-lit and lively studio. Now in a desperate nighttime situation as the rain pours down on an empty highway. Immediately, we see the stress that has come as a result of working on anime. Saruta has 30 minutes to get a copy of the first episode hand-delivered to the TV studio. The direction continues to snap back and forth through time all throughout the episode, as if in a daze brought on by stress of being overworked, losing hours, forgetting the task at hand, and struggling to stay coherent all the while. In the studio, we meet the staff who come across as jaded, worn down by the years and without an ounce of empathy for a hospitalized co-worker, echoing the sentiment that hospitalization or no, the job needs doing, a symptom of an unhealthy work-life culture. The sort of environment where you might be hired on with a promise of weekends off and paid vacation, but quickly you notice no one takes advantage of such. Under the pressure of looming deadlines, all your co-workers stay at the office overnight, work through the weekend, and miss out on weddings, the birth of their child, or simply any sort of social life. There is an increasingly disturbing feeling coming from all these cuts. They become more rapid, the scenes they separate shorter, the reality shared between them less defined. Sarata is clearly losing it as he sees Shonen Bat in pursuit, the infamous child who has been plaguing the city with a string of peculiar assaults and murders. The radio playing in the background with the reports of a murder at an anime studio. Something has clearly gone wrong with Sarata and his team. In a series of scenes blurred with both fact and fiction, Shonen Bat has taken out a number of the studio staff. The passage of time is unclear. Is this happening over the course of days, weeks, or hours? Why do the dwindling staff members seem so comfortable with the fates of their co-workers? Sarta even manages to mistake an animator slumped over her desk as simply exhausted. But as the camera pans down to reveal her contorted neck and bulging eyes, we learn the tragic truth. She still grips her pencil though, even in death. The studio becomes more desolate as time becomes less defined. The colorist lays dead in the street with a smile on her face, as if relieved to finally be out from under all her deadlines. Cutting back to the studio, no one but the production manager and Sarata remain. They hardly care anymore, continuing on out of habit. The production manager fires Sarata, as if to say, this anime is probably dead, our studio may be done, but at least by firing you, I get some small satisfaction. The facade drops. Sarata has truly lost it attacking the production manager who moments before pulled the finished copy of the episode from another co-worker's dead hands. Sarata does the same with fantasies of being the hero, but as we hard cut one last time, he is lying in the street. Someone from the TV studio runs over and takes the tape from Sarata's hand without a care for his well-being. In one last ironic laugh, a scene from the finished episode plays out where Marumi encourages a young baseball bat wielding boy to take a rest. The line repeats as the camera pulls out to the abandoned anime studio. There isn't much interest for subtlety here, and as much as that is often a strength of the anime Khan worked on, subtlety doesn't get the message across as loud as needed. The working conditions of the anime industry in 2004 were broken. Sadly, this has remained true to this day, but the light shown upon the issue has brightened over the years. With a growing worldwide audience, and a more attentive audience at that, criticisms of such will grow louder. It's not going to be an issue solved tomorrow, but there will be a point where those working in the anime industry both in Japan and in the West can do so in better health, be financially secure. 
less afraid of the way their co-workers might perceive them for taking a day off, not have to worry so much about bosses abusing their power. When that day comes, in part, it will do so as a result of Paranoia Agent of Satoshi Khan. I've wanted to make a video about Satoshi Khan for a while now, and having recently watched Paranoia Agent, it seemed like as good excuse as any. His work has had nothing short of a profound effect on my view on anime and so much else. And if somehow you haven't watched his stuff, I could not recommend it enough. You can't go wrong with anything he's done. And there is no better way for me to end this video than by simply saying thank you Satoshi Khan and all those that worked alongside him in his all too short career. I can never truly express how much your work has meant to me, but I hope that impact continues to spread over the years, because your work has brought me solace in times where I've really needed it. So again, thank you Satoshi Khan.